So the beacon, the, so the summit building was was built, and here is the turret that was designed to be exactly at the summit and designed to support the beacon that has just been installed. Over on the right-hand side, you can see the crane lifting up the uh, railing for the catwalk that surrounds the beacon, which is still there today. Uh, it's a little bit of a stretch to call it a crane, too. I, I, I really enjoy the uh, OSHA-approved scaffold that they have. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. and, and also, <coughs> note the, uh, and it's worth noting the crane, uh -huh. we'll talk about that in a minute, the telephone pole. <laughs> and so the beacon was relighted in April of 1941, and and again shown from the summit of the uh, uh, of the summit building, or from the top of the summit building, and and everybody knows what happened on December 7th of that same year, and. And immediately after, this is one of the logs uh, that, that we have. And that, you know, November 25th, trip to Beacon, trip to Beacon, mm -hmm. repaired and inspected. 12-8, trip to, trip to shut off Beacon as to blackout. Mm -hmm. Now those of us who grew up on the West Coast uh, uh, certainly learned about that in history class and so forth. Um, December 8th. And, uh, yeah, yeah December 8th, 1941. The Beacon was shut down. And by the end of World War II, we had radar. And all this system of beacons across the country was suddenly obsolete. Most of them were torn down. Uh, the other four beacons uh, that Standard Oil put up, as far as we know, uh, were scrapped and lost. Uh, we've, we've tried to track them down and, and have gotten nowhere. Uh, Probably because Monte Avalo was a state park by then is the only reason that this particular beacon is oh. still here. Um, so it remained uh, dark until 1964. And on December 7th, um, Admiral Nimitz, Chester W., came out of retirement in Berkeley. Um, he lived on Santa Barbara Road. Uh, came out of retirement in Berkeley and came up to How the summit. How do you know where he lived, John? Is that my cue? I delivered the newspaper to Admiral Nimitz when I was in Berkeley. Wow. Berkeley Gazette. <laughs> and, and, and anyway, uh, he came out and reports vary about this. It's kind of confusing. Um, uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, Kathleen. Um, it was the Pearl Harbor survivors of Oak Chapter Two, Alameda. Alameda, that started this whole thing. I'm also told that it was a significant entourage that came out to mm -hmm. the point of having a band and so forth. Oh yeah, it was a big deal. And and here's my continual request. I, I've probably given 10 or 15 of these beacon talks now, and I ask every single time, does anybody have a photo? of that event. Did you ever get one from Mary Hicks? I never got anything from anybody um, except this, I do have the rest of the text of this article, but here it is. Beacon to Flash Sunday, um, lit for an hour by Fleet Admiral Chester W. Nimitz. And, and you think- Now why was Chester asked to come out and light it? What's the connection? Well. He, he was the commander of the Pacific. Thank you. <laughs> Some Pacific people place. don't know that. <laughs> and what was this one request? So, what was uh, this one request? What was Chester's request? Oh, with the beacon. Help him. I'm going to hear from you, aren't I? Help him. When Admiral Chester Nimitz came out December 7th, 1964, to relight the beacon, it was this one stipulation that he asked that this beacon only be lit one day out of the year to honor the 2403 that perished at Pearl on December 7th, 1941. Right. And to this day, we have held true. Yes, that's true. Uh, might be worthwhile mentioning that Kathleen is the daughter of one of the Pearl Harbor survivors. And the first year that uh, St. Mount Diablo got involved with uh, you know, helping with the beacon ceremony, I had the honor of escorting John up the steps uh, yeah. 
and you know, so he could um, go into the, the ceremony. She's also heavily involved with the sons and daughters of the Pearl Harbor survivors. Yeah. Since 1964, the Pearl Harbor survivors every year would make the annual trek up to the beacon lighting. Now, these guys are in their mid-90s on up, and they, their organization, Pearl Harbor Survivors uh, Association, disbanded December 31st, 2011, and the sons and daughters of Pearl Harbor Survivors, we have stepped up, and we are very honored to co-sponsor the Beacon Lighting event each December 7th with Save Mont Diablo, and I believe that is Save Mont Diablo's anniversary date, yes, is it, it is. not? That's correct. So we co-sponsor this event annually. Well, they are some ideas. Yeah. Yeah, we, um, oh my God. Dude. As Kathleen said, it, is there a sort of a progression? The sons and daughters uh, took it over, and I don't know the whole backstory, and it's not all that important, but the, um, there came to be a problem with appropriate insurance to have these old fellows uh, come up to the summit, and. Well, we had a new superintendent. Of the state park. That I was getting in there. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. the, in, in classic uh, state park bureaucracy way, rather than figuring out a way to make it work for this important event, they just wanted to cancel it and just say, we don't want these old men to come up here anymore. Uh -huh. And I don't know how Save on Diablo got wind of it, but we did. Well, we do have, of course, appropriate stuff to hold events on and around the mountain. and. And our executive director at the time, Ron Brown, was a veteran himself. And he said, we'll do it. And we've been in, in partnership with the Sons and Daughters in St. Mont Diablo uh, ever since. Been very successful. Uh -huh. um, Thank you. This, is how, this is how we used to do it, up at the Summit Building. Um, pretty typical deal, uh, you know, the ceremony and so forth. And then, uh, 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 yeah, there was a few times we couldn't get up there because of the snow. Uh, or an ice storm. Tell you about one of those. Ice snow, ice storm. Bert came too. Yeah, yeah, Bert went tromping through the three feet of snow to get up there. So did Dick. Yeah. Um, so this is what it looked like in uh, 2012 or so. Uh, you see the red light at the top, the beacon shining. Two uh, car tires holding a roof down. <laughs> Seriously. Those, those are the eyes of Diablo. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's the rest of the eyes it's, of Diablo. Uh, up on site, it's very difficult to take a photo of the beacon because the catwalk surrounds it. Uh, and you, I mean, you're stand, to, to get around the beacon, you're, you're kind of doing a little dance. The catwalk is so close to sort of take a close up uh, picture is, is nearly impossible. So. This one is from. Uh, you can see the three inch grade uh, strips of glass. Mm -hmm. Oh, there, oh, there it is. Warehouse. What? You know, like from, from Japan. This thing is behaving. From from down below. Underneath it, it looks like that. I don't know what's going on. Need to train you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I might have to. You, you got oh, it. there it goes. Um, so here's what it, here's what it looks like after we took it down. You can get, get a little bit better photo of it. Um, just to give you some data, it weighs about 1,400 pounds. Um, it's mostly steel, uh, some aluminum, some brass. Uh, the lens itself, it's it's like a great big flashlight uh, reflector light bulb and the front cover, uh, which is three feet in diameter. Uh, the whole thing's about eight feet tall, uh, like that. It's in a, uh, <clears throat> it rotates on a bearing down here, 10 times a minute, uh, or I'm sorry, six times a minute every 10 seconds. And who removed it? We haven't gotten there yet. We haven't gotten there yet. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, you're gonna be my clicker, Jim, this is failing. Um, I mentioned the lamp, whoop, too many times. I mentioned the, uh, yeah, you go back. I mentioned the lamp changer. Um, that's this, they call it a robot. Uh, a lamp would be in front of this bimetal strip, 
and when it burned out, the strip would um, send a current into the switch, and a new light bulb would automatically switch into position, number one. And number two, a telephone call would be made to the switchboard in Diablo to tell the operator to call the electrician to send him up to replace the light bulb. Um, the, the bulb on the left is one of the original ones. Correct me on this, Bert. Uh, original one, I think it was 32 volts uh, DC for those that care about that. Mm -hmm. And then the 120 volt bulb is what was in it uh, after it had been converted to more conventional current. That's um, the bulb that Bert found. Yeah. Wow. <clears throat> um, he, he likes to talk about how the only place he could, only source he could find was from a company named Ushio. In Japan. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> how ironic. <laughs> Um, so finally, um, uh, we started working with the state. Uh, they put up every roadblock they could. Um, and, and second from left, Joan Buchanan, our assemblywoman at the time, uh, mm -hmm. came to bat for Save Monte Diablo and actually introduced legislation um, to allow Save Monte Diablo, a nonprofit, to undertake the restoration of the beacon. Mm -hmm. um, went through the um, <laughs> Went through the legislature, signed by Governor Brown, and, and at that point the uh, state said, okay, you guys are on, and they became very cooperative. Hmm. Uh, they, they put the historians on us. Uh, they started looking for uh, information that they could find. They became very cooperative as soon as somebody from above said, this is what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, so on the left here, this is the director of, at the time of DPR, Department of Parks and Rec, Anthony Jackson, Joan mm -hmm. Buchanan, Ron Brown, our executive director, the park superintendent, Roland Gabert at the time, and the district superintendent, uh, Danita Rodriguez. So finally, we got to start doing some prep work. Um, one, th this will come up in the video, so I don't need to replete it too much. The community of people that came together to help us on this beacon was, um, the second most warming part, the most warming part, of course, were the Pearl Harbor survivors that were behind this thing. But the second most warming part of it was the community that came together to help us. Um, Dick and I both have story after story after story to bore you with about the people that said, hey, I want to be part of this. Mm -hmm. And Redwood Painting was one of them. Um, <coughs> I found Redwood Painting through a totally separate um, group of friends. and. And they said, wow, that's a cool project. And what do they do? These guys don't paint bathrooms or anything. Uh, you don't hire them to paint your kitchen. They paint refineries and PG&E power plants and substations and so forth. And they said, we want to do this. And they provided all the hazmat. <coughs> they scraped all the paint. Of course, lead-based paint. They, they scraped all of that, um, <coughs> all the prep work. Um, before we lifted it down, that's their hazmat suits and so forth. They did the whole thing at no cost to save Mont Diablo. Um, I'd really like to say, you need to hire these guys to paint your kitchen. That's not what they do. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we learned, John, that uh, their uh, production superintendent uh, is oh, the yeah. son of a Pearl Harbor survivor. Uh -huh. Yeah, but he wants nothing to, to do with it. It's just that traumatic an experience for him. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Trust me, I tried getting him to fill out an application, yeah. but he refused. Yeah. yeah, they're great to work with. Yeah. Um, well, here we are. So finally, uh, in June of uh, 2013, um, a little different sized crane uh, provided by Shell, <laughs> Shell Oil came up to lift it down. Um, it was a it was a big day for all of us um, at okay. Saint Bon Diablo's truck. Mm -hmm. um, when it came time to actually do the literal heavy li heavy lifting, um, Shell and Maxim Crane and the riggers and so forth um, didn't didn't quite say this, but it became their baby. Mm -hmm. And the rest of us backed off and just sort of watched. Mm -hmm. And they handled the whole rest of the thing. And the next thing you know, the beacon was uh, sitting on our trailer. Uh, 